but open new possibility with open inf infrastructure. So this is a so um, very very nice event because this is a so an um, event so in the APAC regions. So uh, yeah, you know so um, this kind of discussion is a very very so uh, active in Europe and also North America. So uh, but also I'm very honored to join this event because uh, this is a yeah, still there are a lot of people in this region, but it's not always it's not so easy to join such European uh, meeting or uh, North American meeting. So this is also uh, uh, first time to, to to have such kind of meet uh, webinar at so good good time for so us like so uh, Asia Pacific region. So okay, so uh, now so uh, okay I. I I just tell me some room for this webinar. Um, okay, uh, the, so we have so excellent so four speakers. So I then so you can ask any anything so to any time. So but please use a QA panel or even chat. You can so to other people use uh, chat panels. So uh, if you have some put the question. So a uh, speaker or some, some other may uh, response uh, in, in the chat uh, by uh, panel or even so uh, oral. So, uh, but please, uh, I'm apologize that in, in advance, uh, we have a lot of questions. So we may not so answer every, every, every question. So that's uh, uh, apologize in advance. Okay, so uh, just a very fast so, uh, uh, introduction so of this uh, webinar. So, ah, okay. Uh, my name is Hideaki Takeda. I'm working so uh, in National Institute of Informatics, Japan. So uh, um, I'm also very so uh, uh, advo advocate of uh, open science, and uh, I'm a commit so ORCID, and uh, it, it's a once is a board member of ORCID, and also I'm uh, working so uh, a Japan uh, Link Center. It is uh, one of so uh, 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 reg registration agency of uh, DOI Foundation. So, uh, so that so this is so I, I'm very excited to to join the three uh, uh, organization data site so okay and cross there. So uh, now so yeah these people is working together so to uh, 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 to get so new inf open uh, open infra infrastructure. So uh, this is so uh, probably you can hear so latest so activity so about so these three. Uh, parties, then so uh, you can so uh, ask uh, you may so ask so uh, a question like uh, so such uh, activity even so you yeah, propose anything. So that's so a uh, uh, mission of this uh, webinar. So uh, I'm really excited so to to uh, have this opportunity. So so and uh, also uh, once uh, another thing. So we have some uh, poll. So please, uh, please answer. So, uh, uh, so because we we want to know you. So who is joining this this uh, uh, event? So that's so uh, first session is a poll for for you. Okay, shall, uh, okay. Let me. Uh, okay, I, I will introduce uh, uh, Shauri first. Okay, uh, Shauri is a, is a, okay. So first speaker, first uh, presenter is a Shau, uh, Shauri. Sorry, is a project lead of so implementing fair workflow at data site. She's also responsible for data site so outreach effort in APAC region. So uh, also uh, and, and so called chairing the data site so APAC so expert group. So uh, she, her background is library uh, library science and also uh, joining the data site. She also worked for CERN. Okay. So uh, please start. So uh, uh, Paul by Shauri, please. Thank you, Professor Tadaki, uh, Takeda. Um, I uh, so I'm Sally, and thank you for the introduction. I I'm just starting this uh, session, our webinar, with a small poll um, to get an idea of everybody how. Uh, everybody's idea about infrastructure because this is a complex uh, concept 
and let's see what everybody think before we get into the details. And um, just a small correction, the first uh, talk will be uh, from uh, Cameron uh, on the on the topic of infrastructure. So let's take it. Uh, I have sent the link of the poll um, in the chat, and I will also share screen now so we can see um, the poll. So you can either go to uh, menti.com and use this code on your phone or use the link I have just shared in chat to join the poll. So the first question I have is to use three words or less to describe what does openness mean to you? Let's give it 30 seconds for everyone to put in your answers. There is no wrong answers. You can put whatever that first pop into your head. Open access, accessibility. We have a lot of answers popping on transparency. That's a good one, yeah. Free of charge. <laughs> That's exactly the one that I'm expecting to happen. Um, free paper, findable. Sharing, great. Looks great. Uh, let's move on to the next question. This similar process, use three words or less to describe what does infrastructure mean to you. I popped this question randomly to my husband yesterday and what does infrastructure mean to him? And his first response to me was cars. That is so, <laughs> so not what it is, but uh, get the idea that this could be a confusing concept. Machine goes ping. Great, I love that. <clears throat> Platform, foundation, instrument, data set. Interesting. Workflows. Coming in. Network. Interesting. Okay. Looks great. Okay, let's move on to the last question in this before the first talk. This is a, a, a disagree to agree uh, like her chart question. How much do you agree with the following statement? The first one is the benefit of using services based on open infrastructure is clear to me. How much do you agree with that? The second one is the commitment required for adopting services based on open infrastructure is clear to me. Third one, I would prefer to adopt services that are built on open infrastructure than those that are not when they serve the same purpose. Just give a little bit to reflect on what this means and put in your answer. Okay, so yeah, it looks like this crowd is pretty clear on, uh, on uh, the benefit of infrastructure and uh, they will choose infrastructure, uh, open infrastructure over not so open ones but what does it mean to adopt those? Um, okay, interesting answers. Uh, 
will stop the Mentimeter from now. Uh, we will have more polling as the webinar go on. Um, but now I will give the floor to Cameron uh, to start with the first talk. Professor Takeda, I think you are muted. Okay, uh, thank you. So, uh, Shari, so uh, now we know uh, some about you. So, okay, let's go to the first speaker. So, uh, I'm honored to so uh, introduce uh, Cameron so Nairon. So, uh, um, Cameron is a professor, is a research communication at so Center of Culture and Technology at Cartoon University, Australia. So uh, he's uh, a co-lead of a Carlton Open Knowledge in Initiative. Um, that also, uh, also he's an advocate of open research practice. In the, so uh, that so is a is a support on including so chemistry, advocacy, policy, technology, publishing, so policy, political economy, and cultural studies. Of, uh, it's a very great range of so works. Okay, so, uh, okay, uh, Cameron, so please go ahead. Uh, thanks, and, and thanks, Professor Tadaka, for the, uh, for the introduction, for, to the organizers, um, for inviting me to give this, this talk, um, and for, for all of you for being interested in infrastructure, which is not always a thing which is um, easy to get engaged with. Um, I'm coming to you from, uh, from Perth in Western Australia on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Lake Nation. And I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging and their continuing connection with the land. And also perhaps to think a little about the concept of land as infrastructure, as well as knowledge as infrastructure. So I'm here to talk about open infrastructures, governance of open infrastructures um, in the context of scholarly communication. But I thought I'd start somewhere else because infrastructure, even as you started to answer those questions, you could see there's a little bit of a, a gap, a little bit of a pause before people kept, started to find those three words they thought were about infrastructure. And so I thought there was something, I could maybe talk about something different for a bit um, and something that's something we're all experiencing at the moment and in different ways as a result of different infrastructure investments. And that is the energy crisis that many of us are facing, particularly across Southeast Asia, um, but also across other nations, um, as a result of, of external effects and influences, but also as a result, I will argue, of a failure to be smart about investing in infrastructure over the last 10 or 20 years. So this has been, for those of you who are in Australia and particularly on the eastern coast of Australia, this has been a very particular thing over the last couple of weeks, but this is not restricted to Australia. The war in the Ukraine has led to issues with uh, oil prices and gas prices right across the world. Um, in Australia in particular though, we have a particular problem, um, which is that the way in which we generate power has actually shifted over the last 10 or 20 years. Australia has the largest proportion of its electricity delivered by or generated by solar panels on people's rooftops. So we have in a sense federated um, and expanded, decentralized the way in which we've generated power in this country over the last 10 to 25 years. But at the same time, we've had a political stasis and a lack of coordination in putting in place the infrastructure that would be needed to respond to that. We were used to having energy generated by coal-fired power, power plants in one place, and that then being distributed on a grid to all of the users of electricity around the country. And what's happened is because of the politics um, of climate change, because of the lack of coordination in terms of central coordinated planning for change, 
for the different ways in which we create and generate power today, the Australian system, the Australian infrastructure is particularly poorly equipped to deal with moving power around in the way that it's needed today. And it's particularly poorly equipped to deal with a sh change to be resilient in the face of the kind of shocks in prices and systems we've seen over the last couple of months. So we have had a lack of investment in the right kind of infrastructure to support resilience, to support the capacity to manage change, but also to support innovation and new ways of generating, storing and moving electricity. That coordination has been in part because of the particular political situation in Australia over the last 10 years, but it's also been in part because a lot of this has been left to markets where markets were not very well suited to delivering the kind of change and planning that's required for the future. Markets are good at making things more efficient. They're good at um, creating situations which people find opportunities to offer new services and, and, and cr create opportunities for making money. What markets are particularly bad at is setting up the conditions to support innovation in the future. And they're particularly bad at retaining the kind of capacity to deal with change and shocks to the systems. So let me come back to scholarly communications. Over the last 10 to 25 years, the way in which we produce, disseminate and distribute knowledge has changed. We've moved from a world where it was primarily in print to one where it is primarily online. The mechanisms have changed. The volume and scale of the production of knowledge has changed massively. And the global nature in which we want to communicate and work with other people has also changed from a much more centralized system based primarily, as we've already heard, in Europe and North America. And the residue of that is, yes, many of us are very used to getting up at two o'clock in the morning for calls and information sessions, um, to a world in which there's a much wider creation and, and publication knowledge. And there are different expectations, as you saw in those Mentimeter polls, about being able to access that knowledge rapidly, immediately, um, and ideally, without charge. The systems that were built to manage the flows of information in the 20th century, which were quite efficient and worked quite well in some ways, um, are no longer really fit for purpose. And the markets that created them are not really working as well as they could for us. And in particular, they're blocking the kind of, of innovation that allows us to do things in new ways, but also perhaps the platforms and safety and trust that's needed for us to rely on old systems and new systems. We go back to the electricity issue, the, the power generation issue. In Australia, people expect when they flick a light switch on, on the wall, that the light will go on. Now, many of you may be in countries where you don't have that kind of trust in the systems around you, and many of you are in countries where you do. But the fact that you know you can turn a switch on changes what is possible, just as in the same way, the ability to know that you'll be able to find and access information based on a topic, an area of interest, perhaps who did it, or perhaps where it was done, are important aspects of trust that allow you to take action and to be confident that you will be able to take action as a player in the knowledge economy. And that point about trust, whether we're talking about a light going on when you flick a switch, or whether we're talking about our ability to access information, is what really motivated myself and two colleagues, uh, Jennifer Lynn and Jeffrey Builder, to develop the principles of open scholarly infrastructures. This was a set of a document, a set of principles where we were trying to define what it would mean as a scholar, as a researcher, to be able to trust a system. 
what does it mean for me to be able to know that I will be able to go to my computer and know that the literature is still there, to know that I can find it, to know that I can traverse it and query it in the ways that I need to today in my particular context? How do I know that it's being managed in my interests? How do I know that the focus is not simply on making money, but on being able to serve the kinds of needs of a global audience of global contexts that might not in and of themselves be places where money is likely to be made. So how can we make that more equitable? The, the energy crisis is playing out in very different ways in Sri Lanka and India than it is in Australia or Singapore. And the reasons for those are, again, a lack of control, a lack of things being managed in the interests of those countries compared to those places where we're either generating the gas or where we're wealthy enough to have control over it. So again, the concept here is, is one of trust, knowing that I can go and use and work with things that the databases I need on a day-to-day -day basis will still be there tomorrow, will still be there in 10 years time, so that the investment I'm making on putting data into them will still be recognized and still be there and available, that my contribution to them will be collected and recognized, and that they'll be properly indexed and be discoverable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, as those terms from the FAIR um, acronym came up in that, in that first question about, about openness. So when we wrote the principles of open scholarly infrastructures, what we wanted to do was find a set of guidelines that would mean as a researcher, I could have trust in an organization, essentially that it would still be there, that it would still be there for me, um, and that it would be financially sustainable, that it would be governed in the interests of people like me, researchers like us, um, and um, that the data and the systems and the technology would also be robust and stable. And I keep coming back to this point that it's really all about trust and infrastructure is fundamentally something that you trust to be there even when you don't think about it. And really, in some sense, that's all infrastructure actually is. It's the stuff that you don't think about because you just trust that it's going to be there. So when we talked about those principles, we focused on, on three things that we felt were important. Um, Probably the, the top one was governance. So how is this infrastructure managed and controlled? Who gets to say what it does and how? And we focused on ways in which that could be controlled and looked after by the community. We were concerned about financial sustainability. Um, because we rely on these things, it's important, as I say, that they're still there tomorrow, the day after, and in 10 years time. Because this is the scholarly record, we want to make sure that that material is still there in 100 years' time, um, even as language and technology changes. And then the third part was partly about the technology, but also partly about how you really define ways in which you can feel you can trust something. Um, and we called that um, insurance. And that wasn't necessarily the best term that we could have used. Um, but what we meant by that was that things like it being built on open source, things like it being based on open data, and most importantly, that those open source and open data and open technology platforms were deployed in such a way that it would be possible to replicate the system. And this is probably the hardest bit of the principles to understand, but in some ways for me, I think is the, is the most important. Because when you run an organization, when you're trying to provide services, you're always having to make compromises. You never have all of the money you want to do all of the things. And it's always really difficult to consult with all of the people you want to engage. So what we wanted to do was set up a situation where people could be working towards making systems better, making them more trustworthy, that 
the types of things they did would be signals, signals that made you feel like you, this, you could trust this organisation, this system, this infrastructure, this database, this index. And so the idea of insurance of open source and open data and the ability for a community in the extreme to be able to say, well, actually, this has gone in a direction we don't like, and we can take this away and replicate it, not because that's something you want to happen or that it's necessarily going to be easy, but that that sets up a tension between the interests of the community and perhaps the interests of the organisation and the money um, that delivers something productive, a conversation about how to take this forward. In the scholarly communications world, as I said, things have changed. We've moved from this print world to a digital world. We've moved from a world perhaps of documents to worlds of connections between people, places, outputs, data, articles. And we're still working out how to coordinate all of these things together. What we do know is that there's much more that's possible in the future. And you're going to hear from each of the organisations represented here today about some of those possibilities. If we're going to support that kind of innovation, then what I'm asking you to do and to think about is how do we invest in the infrastructure, in the systems, not just that lets us record what we're doing today, but that provides the systems that allow for innovation, for change, but also for response to external shocks and problems and, and issues. Systems that can be trusted to record all of the outputs that we are making, whether they be research articles or data sets. Uh, organisations that can be trusted to track who we are and, and, and what we are doing. Organisations that help us and systems that help us to connect those things together so we know that this organisation is affiliated with this data set and that article and those people are all connected. Because when we connect those things up together, we can do new things um, that were not possible before. I'm not here to talk about the work we're doing at, at Curtin and the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, but what I will say is we have been able to do an amazing amount of work precisely because these infrastructure organisations provide data at a scale and in ways that we can use and that we can trust them to be there for the long term. So what I want you to think about is how we invest in the future of these systems in the future of open scholarly infrastructures that provide a platform that allow us not just to do what we're doing today, but to innovate into the future, to be resilient to change and to, to shocks in the system. Because if we've learned something from the last six months and perhaps the two years behind that, I hope one of the things that we might be learning is we don't need, we need to do more than simply make our systems efficient. We need to make our systems stable, safe, and trustworthy. And that requires investment of time. It requires investment of money. And it also requires investment in a commitment to the idea that, that these shared open infrastructures matter. But what we get for that is community-owned systems that serve our communities and where we have a stake in what that future is. The market system and the lack of coordination in Australia have left us with a crisis that is going to take decades to unpick as we have to catch up on the way we should have built the electricity grid system over the last 10 to 20 years. We have an opportunity in scholarly communications to do that so much better. Um, and the opportunity is there right now for us to take control and invest in these systems for the future. Um, so I hope with what you hear in the other talks this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are in the world, um, that we can collectively move towards that and take forward a shared vision of shared infrastructures that deliver on our capacities for the future. So with that, I'll stop and thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. So, hey, very nice talk. So uh, yeah, it's very important. So key word is trust. 
yeah, so uh, open infrastructure. So, okay, let's go. Okay, uh, uh, please, uh, please put in some questions so uh, to Cameron. So if uh, um, I will pick up so later. So uh, then, so uh, again, so have uh, another poll. <laughs> okay, uh, show me please. Hi everyone, back to conduct another poll. We are entering to a round of presentation by the three organizations as uh, uh, organizing this event. So this is going to be about the organizations. This is the same Menti pool that we were using before, and I'm copying the uh, uh, the chat. Could, could someone help me put the chat in the link? Uh, put the link in the chat again, uh, or you can uh, access it on Menti using the code 12 17 80 18. Uh, let's start. So, what is your organization member of? Let's see, it could be a member of multiple of these organizations. It should be a quick one and uh, <coughs> apologies. Um, right. Um, moving on to the next question. Which organization do you want to learn more about through this webinar? Okay, interesting. Moving on to the next question. What do you value the most about open identifiers? The options are sustainability, openness, trustworthiness, interoperability, equity, and functionality. Interesting. I wonder if equity doesn't get a lot of love because it's compared to the other qualities is slightly vague what we mean by that, but we'll learn more about it in the next talks. Um, last question, how much do you agree with the following statement? The first one, I have sufficient knowledge about open identifiers to use them, use them in my workflow. The second one, it is easy for me to communicate the idea of open identifiers to my peers. The third one, I know where I can find support when I have troubles using open identifiers. Five more seconds for the answer to come in. Great. Um, that's it for this small poll. And uh, we'll come back to some of this when the uh, at the end of the webinar, webinar and see if
people have learned more and changed their answers. So now I give the floor back. Okay, thank you, Xiaomi. Xiaomi. Um, okay, yeah, uh, okay. I, uh, we know so you are more like a, probably so the, yeah. Um, participant of this this uh, winner, so they have so uh, knowledge about so uh, open identifier, but so yeah, you are willing to tell your peers <laughs> so to transfer the so knowledge so to others. So that's the reason maybe it's leading to to attend this event. So, okay, okay, very great. It's a great poll. Okay, okay. So now, so from now, so have a uh, three speaker from three organizations. Okay, so first speaker is from Crossref. So, uh, Vanessa Fairhurt. So, uh, Vanessa is a community engagement manager at Crossref. She's based on uh, Oxford, UK. So, um, Vanessa supports Crossref so diverse global community by running a so variety of March lingual and March time zone webinar and events like this so uh, and also managing so cross left so ambassador pro, uh, ambassador program and community forum so and and she's working collaboratively with others like to enhance family communication and so lower barrier of participation uh, before so joining so cross left so uh, uh, Vanessa worked at so uh, an uh, uh, IN, I, NASP is a like so focus on the so improvement to so access to scholarly communication and research in developing countries. Okay, so uh, Vanessa, please start. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I think you should all be able to see my screen full screen now, but do let me know if you can't. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone from wherever you're joining us today. It's great to see so many people across so many different countries. Um, so I'm going to talk about open infrastructure um, in relation to Crossref. Hopefully I might answer some of the questions that you might have about uh, open infrastructure and Crossref and also the use of open identifiers. So just to first of all give a bit of an overview about Crossref. So Crossref, Datasite and ORCID, we all offer unique persistent identifiers or PIDs. Uh, so ORCID IDs for people and Crossref and Datasite uh, DOIs for research outputs. And this is mostly what people still associate with us. Um, however, these identifiers together form an infrastructure that is integral to the global research ecosystem. Um, they enable dis disambiguation and they set the foundation for reliable and robust, robust links between entities. Um, at Crossref, we now see ourselves more as an open infrastructure provider and we're deeply committed to the co collaborative development of in infrastructure tools and services that ensure that scholarly research metadata is distributed, uh, registered and linked uh, for the benefit of the scholarly community. And we work with a really diverse group of members and organisations around the world, with now over 19,000 uh, member organisations across more than 140 countries. And we have a metadata store of over 135 million scholarly content items, and this is growing every day. So we do say that a DOI is just the start. When members register their content with us, they assign it a DOI and we collect metadata about that piece of content. We then process this metadata so that connections can be made between publications, people, organizations, and other associated outputs. And we preserve all this metadata that we receive for the scholarly record, and we make it openly available across a range of different interfaces, so open APIs and search tools, so that the community can come along, uh, use this, and build their own tools with it. So as I was saying, our member suppliers with a wide range of metadata that we then make openly available. We have minimal requirements because we need to support a variety of different publishing practices. And basic metadata might include things like titles, author names, publication dates, uh, issue numbers, ISSN, this type of thing. And we also collect uh, non-bibliographic data about the items registered as well. So this can include reference lists, funding data, ORCID, uh, identifiers, license data, clinical trial information, abstracts, data about relationships between items. And we do ask that our members send us as much metadata as possible and that it is accurate and clean. 
So the more comprehensive your metadata is, the more likely your content will be discovered and disseminated, and the more useful it makes other collaborative services that are powered by this infrastructure that we provide. And who uses Crushref? So publishers are still our largest group, and this is the group of people who founded Crushref originally. But our infrastructure has become critical to the whole scholarly research community. So funders can now also join Crossref to assign DOIs and register metadata about grants. And all this metadata that our members provide is then used by many others in the scholarly community. So this can include uh, universities, indexing services, data analytics systems, library discoveries tools, uh, and many, many more. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we see in the future at Crossref. So this is our vision uh, statement. It's fairly new, and we feel that all our vision state, all vision statements, should come prefaced with uh, "like others," as it describes a world that we imagine uh, for everyone in the future, not just our role in getting there. So we, like others, envision a rich and reusable open network of relationships connecting research organizations, people, things, and actions. A scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. I hope that no one here uh, disagrees with that statement. Uh, please let me know if you do. Um, but I'll talk a bit about how we're now trying to convey this vision. So this, in the past, um, you will have heard us talk a lot about the, the things in the center of this diagram. So these are the objects, uh, the entities or the outputs uh, that are involved in the research process. And we used to talk a lot about uh, Crossref about introducing new content types. And we have introduced a lot of new content types. Um, and we used to talk also a lot about identifiers. So these are the, the unique open strings that identify these objects and entities. And we spent a lot of time planning for new content types like preprints and new relationships like versions. Um, so each of the labels here would, be, would have been its own project. So the research nexus is our approach to scaling uh, what we do at Crossref. So we realized that as a community, we still need to identify the different objects um, in the research um, system. But beyond that, it's the relationships between them that are becoming more important. So persistent ident identifiers are necessary for this, but they're not sufficient on their own. The aim is to give context to these objects and entities. So where do they sit in the wider picture? So who has authored a piece of work? Who adapts it and when? Are there comments, are there modifications? So the value of Crossref doesn't come just from the DOI, uh, but it comes from the metadata and how these links and relationships in that metadata capture what we call the research nexus. So making connections between the authors, the funders, the research institutions, the publications, and the other outputs. And we now consciously operate as an open scholarly uh, foundational infrastructure, making 135 million records, plus all their connections and relationships, visible and trackable through our open metadata and APIs. And we collaborate with a wide range of different organizations to help identify and capture these relationships. And how are we going to achieve this vision? Well, firstly, we need open and accessible metadata, and Crossref has a key role to make here, uh, to play here, making the metadata that's provided by our members openly available in a consistent format for both human and machine interfaces. Next, in order to link everything persistently, we need persistent identifiers for all activities, uh, inputs, outputs, contributors, and again, um, available for human and machine interfaces. So this isn't just about Crossref, we need to work closely with other organizations like Orchid and Datasight, um, and RAW, for example, for organization level identifiers. Community awareness and collaboration is also key. So working with initiatives such as um, the Initiative for Open Citations, the Initiative for Open Abstracts, Metadata 2020, and many other similar like-minded uh, organizations. And finally, a vital piece of the picture is the com uh, our commitment to the principles of open scholarly infrastructure that Cameron talked about. So because to meet our goal, Crossref has to be both transparent and trusted. So to touch a little bit more on the principles of open scholarly infrastructure and why we chose to adopt these at Crossref. So we believe that inclusive and efficient open research depends on uh, found the foundational open scholarly infrastructure and a shared infrastructure should be open, community governed, sustainable and trusted by the research community. And as services that the scholarly community relies on um, have been closed down or sold over the years, 
it's really important to understand and assess what actually constitutes open scholarly infrastructure. The principles uh, were conceived to ensure that stakeholders of a community led organization and initiative uh, or initiative, sorry, have a clear say in setting its agenda and priorities and can even carefully close it down and start up an alternative if need be. So the principles guide transparency, trustworthiness, openness, sustainability, insurance and responsive community governance. And they provide a framework for self-assessment and a way to build trust in the scholar community. There's quite a few organisations that have already adopted uh, POSI so far, and they include uh, Crossref, Dryads, Raw, JOS, Open Research, Open Citations, uh, the OA Switchboard, Datasite, and some others. Not everyone who's signed up to these principles meets all of the principles just yet, but all of these initiatives have committed to working towards doing so. So why did we decide that this was right for Crossref? Well, it supports open research, and this is really important for us, obviously. Uh, it enables us to assess and build trust in the open scholarly infrastructure and services that underpin open research. It's based on real experiences, so it's inspired by the experiences of forming uh, ORCID um, back in the day, by running Crossref and by setting up RAW, which is the Research Organization Registry. It's already been well received by the community, so adopting POSI has in turn inspired many to evaluate reference, build upon or extend the principles themselves. We have a need for broader governance, so existing open infrastructures, metadata and services, they all need to be trusted, as Cameron was talking about, trust is so important, and they need to be accessible by all parties at all levels of experience and across all geographies, which I think does touch upon the equity point uh, that came up in the poll. We need to identify others to collaborate with. So having a set of principles is really important to provide a framework for our discussions with other organizations and it enables like minded initiatives to form trusted bonds and to share their operations, leading to more integrated services for all. It's practical and measurable so organizations like Crossref can then report on their ad adherence to the principles, so if you go on our blog you'll see uh, there was a blog post a couple of months ago where we're reporting on our progress towards these principles. Some of the principles are aspirational uh, and it might be difficult for any organization to meet, but there is an expectation that an organization wouldn't be able to meet them all perfectly immediately, uh, but they're important because they're an outline of a direction of travel and uh, uh, things to work towards. And they're also balanced, so it's not a list uh, of things to be cherry picked, they're an interrelated whole, uh, balancing out different concerns and risks. And going through the principles gave us a few areas at Crossref to change and improve upon already. So we're reviewing our governments, uh, we're broadening our board, uh, we've recently included a funder on the board last year. Uh, we're working towards improving our sustainability, so working towards a 12 month contingency fund uh, and also being more transparent about our operations. Um, so we've got a new page on our website with lots of financial information on it. Open data and available data. So again, we already make lots of our data open, but we've also started to publicly release metadata files. Uh, the mo most recent of those is in May of this year, and it includes over 134 million metadata records. Open source uh, code and support and issue bugging, uh, issues and bug fixing. So continuing to open source more of our code and more of our issue tracking. And our support has now moved also to a more open setting. So we have a community forum where people can come and ask questions. Um, and discussing uh, closer alliances with several other infrastructure organizations, um, such as today's webinar. And these are just a few examples of the recent changes um, that we've made at Crossref, and you can read more about them um, on our blog page. Uh, so just before I end, I've mentioned RAW, which is the Research Organization Registry, a couple of times during this talk. Um, and it's a really good example of a collaborative open infrastructure initiative and also a community led project. Um, and it was developed to solve the problem of the difficulty of correctly identifying and disambiguating the names of institutions. Um, and it provides an open, sustainable, uh, unique identifier for each research organization in the world. Um, so as you can see here in this example, I've chosen Curtin University, which is a, the institution that Cameron is based at. Um, and you can see the raw identifier for this particular institution. You can also see above that there are a few different names that this institution might have gone by in the metadata, and this is a way to uniquely identify it. These identifiers are interoperable with others. They're supported in the Crossref and Datasite metadata. 
Um, and as you can see in the example, it enables our members to correctly identify and include author affiliations in the metadata. And this provides another important piece of information to help us achieve the research nexus. And this was previously missing um, before our communities got together and our organizations worked together in order to create this new initiative to fill in this gap in the metadata. So I'll end my short talk on a more practical note of what you can do to help us achieve our vision of a more connected and open scholarly record. So as I was saying, identify as unnecessary but not sufficient. Ensure you send comprehensive metadata to organizations such as Crashref. Include providing license information and funding information when possible. Cite related work, including data. Collect and include raw identifiers with your affiliation metadata. And encourage your authors to use and submit ORCID identifiers as well. So the Research Nexus is a shared vision. We can't achieve it alone. Our shared scholarly infrastructure only works as well um, as long as it's interoperable, open and collaborative. So enabling researchers and publishers and others to provide the most comprehensive and accurate metadata is vital to this. Um, thank you very much. There's some links there. We'll be, share, be sure to share the presentations and the recordings uh, after today. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, nice introduction to CrossF and nice introduction of uh, uh, Ozzy. So okay, and then so go, go to the next speaker from uh, data site. So uh, so again, so Shari Chen. So uh, uh, Shari is a project lead of implementing fair workflow at data site, and uh, she's also responsible for data site so out, outreach effort in APAC region. So. Uh, and also, uh, she's a co-chairing the uh, data site, so APEC expert group. So, oh, sorry, I again, again so uh, um, yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, I got that. So um, yeah, okay, and uh, uh, so okay, so uh, okay, uh, okay. Be before before joining the data site, she's working for Serun. So uh, again, also, yeah. Sorry, I, I should I should wrong introduction. So before, so I'm, I apologize. That. Anyway, okay, please, so, uh, shall we please? <laughs> Um, no need to apologize. That's that's perfectly okay. And thank you very much for the introduction uh, again. And let me share my screen. Um, right. Okay. So hello everybody, and thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for tuning in. And I will be talking about how data sites operates as part of the global open scholarly infrastructure network, alongside Crossref and Orchid to connect research and identify knowledge. So as most of you already know that uh, uh, Datasite is a global nonprofit membership organization. We work with more than 2,600 repositories around the world to provide DOIs for data and many other types of research outputs. So up until this month, <clears throat> these repositories are managed by are 276 members. They are spread across 50 countries and represent more than a thousand organizations. Our community has collectively registered over 35 million D, uh, DOIs at, up to this point. Remember, these are alternative research outputs uh, as opposed to uh, that uh, Crossref is mainly for research articles, um, but we are all aware both uh, working to, uh, to include more research types in our um, to our to our scope of service. Um, our vision at DataSide is connecting research, identifying knowledge. This is also a shared vision of the DataSide community and the wider open science community. And since our funding in 2009, DataSide have been open to participation from members around the world. We work with research organizations, including funders and other facilities to provide the means to create, find, cite, connect, and use research. It is our collective effort as a community that protects the investment in open infrastructure. So the strength of a data site is in its active community membership. Coming back to the open infrastructure topic, uh, as we have seen in the polls, that is not an easy concept to wrap one's head around. So Cameron and the colleagues 
uh, at CrossDrive have coined the term SEMA, um, representing storage identifiers, metadata, and assertions, also known as like a relationship between objects as a shorthand for infrastructural components. Um, simply put, we call these core components that enable the creation of tools and services used by researcher, uh, researchers' infrastructure. And when these infrastructures are made openly available to everyone with no barrier to access, they become open infrastructure. So open infrastructure should ideally possess the following attributes. They should be governed by a community. They should be financially sustainable and provide inference of long-term viability, thus being trustworthy. Um, they should provide value, obviously, and be interoperable and equitable in terms of access of service. I will walk through this list in the next couple of minutes to demonstrate how data sites operate with these attributes built in. But I should first mention that the first three of these attributes are covered in detail in the uh, policy uh, principles that both Cameron and Cameron uh, and Vanessa have mentioned in their, in their talks. Um, Datasite has conducted a self-audit against the policy principles, and the full report is published on the Datasite blog. I encourage everyone to look it up and to see how we measure up. Um, this can be accessed uh, on the DOI displayed on the page. And at that site, we affirm our commitment to uphold these principles, and we're actively working towards full compliance. So first off, governance. Uh, DataSite is governed by its members and executive board directed by our statutes. DataSite members are the voting body of the organization. They meet annually to approve DataSite revenue and expenditures, uh, stand to vote for the executive board and guide us as strategy, put forth uh, resolutions and modifying the statutes. There are currently approximately 80 seats across uh, the board, the steering groups and working groups that form our governance structures. The two steering groups help data side with priority setting and identify strategies related to sustainability planning services and outreach. The service and technology steering groups work with the re data working group and the metadata working group to provide expertise and advice on data size product and technology development. The community engagement steering group uh, work with several regional expert groups to monitor and assess community needs, provide feedback and recommendations, uh, as well as building relationships in different regions, promote collaboration and cultivate exchanges. And as I uh, publish uh, annually our, our report and the board, uh, board meeting summaries on the organization website, these are all on the governance page So in terms of sustainability, data size is sustainable through membership and service fees from organizations around the world. Our fee model adheres to the following principles. Predictability through grant, uh, graded and fixed tiers. Scalability as we continue to support the growing demands of our community. Sustainability by aligning with data size core cost drivers. Simplicity by applying fees at the organization level. Inclusive inclusivity in providing low fees for smaller organizations. So there are options to join the data community as part of a consortium or directly as a, as a direct member. So different fees apply to these different types of memberships. Uh, we publish our organizational budget on the annual report. On the slide are the breakdown of funding sources in a glance. For the past years, so we have maintained a ratio of one-third project funding from grants and two-third membership fee in the funding sources. Uh, in, the, in the new report, we also have breakdown of expenditures, um, which we keep relatively consistent, uh, except for during COVID, where our engagement and uh, uh, travel budget have lowered significantly. So when it comes to inference, to the extent possible under law, DataSite has waived all copyright and related or neighboring rights to the DataSite data file under CC0 license. What we mean by DataSite data file is that uh, we mean all the DOIs and deposits metadata in our database. 
all of the data sets code and software processes are openly managed on GitHub. And the development roadmap and prioritization are also discussed regularly uh, in our community meetings, mem uh, member meetings, open hours, and all the different channels. As part of this, our code is published openly on GitHub under full permissible MIT license. And we operate on an open and transparent basis to ensure accountability within our governance structures. So in terms of value provided, we usually summarize these into three categories. So first of all, we are a registration agency. We provide DOI registration service. On top of uniquely identifying resources, the metadata from our membership organizations are openly accessible and indexed by major search engines. Secondly, we streamline the DOI registration process to make fair compliance easy. We also help our members to connect with a wider PIT community to learn from each other and always keep abreast of the progress in the field. Last but not least, we provide value evaluating services to simplify reporting by showing data citation and usage analytics. And interoperability is one of the four uh, FAIR principles alongside the findability, accessibility, and reusability. DOI and their metadata provide centralized and standardized access to repository records worldwide, which support interoperability by making it easier for other systems to use that data. Thus, that DOI and the metadata behind them are openly mineable and free to use by members and non-members alike through our public APIs. So, equitable access. Uh, Equity is shown on both sides, is access to equitable access to resources and equitable access to opportunities. The different stakeholders can reap the benefit from data set from various points of access. The repository platform can integrate with the API to provide DOI registration functionality. The harvesters can use OAI PMH to ingest data set metadata. The research institutions can obtain uh, metrics from many uh, research outputs and developers can reuse the data code to build their own applications. So on the other side of this is that in a governance perspective, as vote, uh, the, each data set members have one vote in participating in the General Assembly elections and voicing the concerns for the services and strategies that we are uh, working on at data set. So that is all. I hope that provides you with uh, nice overview of what the site is and, uh, as part of the open infrastructure. Uh, please follow all uh, these social media websites and uh, visit PIT Forum, which is an important platform for uh, the friends of PIT to communicate and keep the conversation going about, uh, about inf infrastructures. Um, yeah, I look forward to answering your questions in the discussion session. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Shaori. So uh, nice, in, uh, nice talk about so uh, uh, data site. Okay, so uh, okay, we are, so, uh, go to the next, the final so uh, presentation is by so Estil Chen so from so Orchid. So uh, brief introduction of uh, Estil is a, Estil is a engagement manager at Global Direct at Orchid. She supports and engages ORCID direct members, publishers, and service providers. So she is based on in Taiwan. So uh, and uh, so she uh, she works so collaboratively with the community and to promote adoption of ORCID and establish its community and practice. Um, before joining ORCID, so uh, she served as a product manager of uh, uh, RIT. So, uh, so uh, um, research agency of uh, DOI Foundation. So I know her. So when she's she's working for uh, RIT. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm I'm happy to meet so again in different so positions. So anyway, so okay, uh, please uh, uh, please present so you uh, uh, now. Yeah, thank you, Takeda. So, hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen, but stop my video for better connections. So, I'm doing it now. So, okay. Just let me do it. Okay, here we go. Okay, can you see my screen now? I think so, right? 
Yep. Yes. Okay. Correct. Great. Okay, I'm going to start presenting. Yeah, thank you, Takeda-san, for your introduction. So today, I hope to use this chance to share a bit more about how, why, and what Orki is and builds a part of open research infrastructure. So uh, I'm going to briefly cover a few things today. So uh, I'm going to introduce or re use ORCID a bit and to share a bit more on ORCID and open research infrastructure. And I'm happy to learn your feedback and to discuss with you. So let's from the introduction part. So ORCID is an independent non-for-profit organization registered in the US. We are open to participation by all. The ORCID registry launched in 2012 and we are sustained by membership fees. We are guided by our values and funding principles. Orkia is a community governed organization by a board of directors elected by our members. And Orkia's mission is to enable transparent and trustworthy connections between researchers, their contributions, and their affiliations by providing a unique and persistent identifier for individuals that they can use in a research workflow. And ORCID stands for Open Research and Contributor Identifier. We provide three main services. The first is the ORCID ID. It's a unique persistent identifier piece free for researchers. And we provide a set of APIs, services, and support of communities that computers actually can use across systems to exchange information in the research workflow and researchers can share their ORCID ID with organizations, mm -hmm. and organizations can use our API to exchange information. And ORCID is a place to store and share those different connections between IDs, people, and their research activities and affiliations. And now we have reached a great uh, critical global participation. So we have members across 56 countries. We have 25 national consortia. We have members, uh, over a thousand member globally, and more than a thousand systems that uh, adopt ORCID into their research workflow. And uh, as I shared, so ORCID is a community driven organization. So we work with different stakeholder groups. So as researchers are always at the center of our activity. And meanwhile, we also with, uh, work with publishers, universities, vendors, funders, or policy makers. And uh, for us to our member community, so for working members, we have direct members and also consortia members. So at ORCID, consortia is a group of nonprofit organizations. They work together, they form a community of practices, they adopt ORCID into their national context or use their uh, national workflow in a more co coordinated way. And a closer look I want to share is about ORCID in APEC community. So we have around 160 members now, most of them are consortia members and uh, about 46 is direct members. And we have four consortia in this region, in Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and in Taiwan. And we have about 161 systems that use ORCID connected with our member API to their uh, research workflow. And Asia accounts for the second largest traffic to the ORCID registry. And here, I want to dive into a bit deeper about why and how ORCID is a part of open research infrastructure. So let's begin with what research communities want. So through collecting feedback from our member communities, we identify their goals include supporting open science or research and reduce administrative burden, and report about research impact and improve visibility of researchers, improve interoperability, which is also um, a key word from our course just now. And they want to identify disambiguate researchers. They want to improve data quality. They want to meet or set a national or funded policy. And I think now it's very natural to ask, we have the goals, but do research communities have an adequate research infrastructure to achieve goals? 
and what's the current uh, operation of those research infrastructure in place. So in fact, we do have research infrastructure there, but in a sense of fragmented. So as you can see, there are very various platforms and services now in a research workflow already. So there are a lot of university repositories, journal databases, national services, funder databases, or for-profit, non-profit repositories. And on the right hand side, you see a lot of different services it's like index services or library records, even researchers own CVs. However, although it is the case, those platforms or systems stand alone, closed in a sense, then the challenge is that how do we exchange information and ensure it flow across different parts of the infrastructure to achieve our goals? So that means we need infrastructure to connect with each other to persist over time and, and to allow to exchange and make use of information. And uh, usually when we speak of, of infrastructure, as I just also see in the pools, or we, we, always, we sometimes think about facilities, of course, but uh, in reality, researchers are part of research infrastructure too. The research infrastructure is about providing resources or services for the communities, actually naming researchers, people to conduct research and foster innovation. And open persistent identifiers like ORCID enable such infrastructure to connect researchers, institutions, and research outputs. So we work with different persistent identifiers for organizations, for research outputs, and also for grants or funding. And uh, ORCID was built from the ground up to be open and trustworthy in the research infrastructure. So ORCID's value is open, collaborative, and inclusive means global and diverse, and trusted means transparent, persistent. So to deliver our values, both technical and social constructs are equally important. So technically, ORCID uh, software is open source and uh, we support fair open data. We have open public API that are that can be used by any individuals and we uh, release our open public data file annually. And we have an open sandbox testing environment. Our product roadmap is always open to feedback. And of course, we are open to support different fields used by our community. And socially, so our, uh, we are committed to research control. So we are open to researchers. And we want to ensure we have an equitable, sustainable business model. And our membership opens to all organizations and uh, we are open to uh, continue engagement uh, engage continuously engage with our community and uh, I want to speak a little bit more about trust which is also highly uh, highlighted in the, our uh, keynote speech today so speaking of trust part of our success actually comes from our distributed incremental trust model. So we engender trust by balancing research control and data quality. So ORCID actually use a distributed incremental trust model, which allows reliable and trustworthy data sources to validate information on OK record, of course, with the record holder's permission. And users of ORCID data can determine the trustworthiness of each record by looking at trust markers, including affiliations added by research institutes or works publications added by publishers or repositories, and uh, the other is about different links uh, between different uh, IDs. So uh, last but not least, I want to highlight that OK enables openness, persistence, and interoperability through the research ecosystems. Uh, in a sense that researchers can connect their ORCID ID with different systems in the research infrastructures and different systems can ex exchange validated information in an open, interoperable and persistent way. We provide a mechanism to indicate who connects what and how that is done. And to recap, so uh, the community builds and benefit from an open research in infrastructure 
ORCID strives to enable those connections, transparent and trustworthy connections between researchers, their contributions and their affiliations, and adapting fit to foster such a, an open research infrastructure will actually further require commitment, both individuals and organizations. And of course, we always anticipate uh, more engagement in the Asia or Asia Pacific region through the additional conversation, uh, collaboration or adoptions. And uh, on the right hand side is our uh, vision. We want to, uh, so we hope to that everyone and every stakeholder in the research community can benefit from ORCID to collect validated information and to also connect uh, information back to automate uh, the ex the, and exchange the information workflow. And I'm happy to learn your feedback and to discuss with you. And you can contact me as always. And we have some resources available in our website. So yeah, thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, thank you very much. So Esther, so uh, yes, nice talk, nice, intu nice introduction about ORCID. So uh, yeah, so uh, I'm happy to to have a presentation for these three important so uh, organizations. So, and I am happy to see so different color pattern of each so organization. <laughs> that, so uh, so I have I have uh, about fifteen minutes so for discussion. So from now, so uh, yeah. So uh, if I, any question, so uh, okay, so I'm okay. I'm ask the participant. So if I have any questions, so uh, please put your question on the QA panel. So uh, meantime, so uh, okay. So do have so any question to each other? So from as a, a speaker. That's yeah. So. Okay. Um, okay. I, I I kick off. I kick off the discussion. So um, um, yeah. Probably so. Um, so participant so of this as a webinar, um, and is probably so already uh, and know so like uh, importance of uh, um, so openness of uh, uh, research infra infra infrastructure, and so also so importance of each activity of each so uh, uh, organizations so uh, but so probably so is a so problem so uh, of so uh, theirs is that so how to so tell this 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 to uh, other people like uh, so is that like so one so target is a uh, uh, so this uh, like a so colleague of, of university like the researchers and also uh, it's a different also uh, administrator of uh, university like so uh, that is so is uh, that is very um uh, important so uh, because uh, even so uh, uh, because uh, sometimes so uh, you have to uh, need some so action by so organizations so uh, what's the, so um what's a, a message so uh, to uh, to participants, so how what to take away? So uh, good good message. So to so to persuade so uh, uh, other people. So uh, to uh, so any any so comment or on that? Okay, uh, no, I'll, I'll 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 take a go at it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there's a couple of different messages. Yeah. Um, one of them is, I guess, as I said, I mean, we can go back to um, the toilet paper shortages from two years ago, um, the supply chain issues, and there's a very powerful thing that was said to me during the during the, the pandemic, which was uh, an, organ uh, an organization that is not in control of its supply chain mm. is an organization that is not going to survive a crisis. We are knowledge organizations, so we need to understand and be engaged with the knowledge supply chain. Um, now that that works for certain kind of people. I think the other the other argument that we've seen working quite well um, for university leadership and administration, um, we discovered that university administrations are not necessarily inherently conservative. Um, 
but they are very busy. Um, and they usually have one or two things that they're passionate about. So your president or your vice chancellor will have something specific that they're passionate about changing in the organization and demonstrating the possibilities that arise. Um, and so for us at Curtin in particular, we've had a, a number of people very concerned about equity and diversity in senior leadership. And so being able to show um, that we can get better information on, on the, the ways in which um, different groups of people are seen in the system has been very powerful. Um, but it's, it's about finding what that person cares about and then linking the value of infrastructures to them, not just telling them that they should change what they care about and they should care about identifiers and infrastructures. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any other comments for, for uh, to my questions? Okay. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I can, I can. Um, just, I, I, yeah, building on what Cameron was saying that, you know, it's, it is about sort of uh, trust in different organizations and collaboration. So, you know, we, we only exist as much as the information that you send us and our community that we can work with. Um, so, you know, please do uh, participate, get involved in conversations, let us know what we can do to help meet your needs in your community so we can improve what we do um, to be able to do that better. And do send us as much metadata as possible to be able to, to power the existing services that we have as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, uh, okay, so uh, any other response? Uh, okay. Um, now, so I have uh, some questions. So, uh, okay, I pick up so one. So, okay, so uh, questions from uh, Simon. Uh, Simon, so are, are there any way to that you are seeing researcher advocate for the use of P uh, PIT? when using systems that not natively support them. So, like, uh, yeah, that's the thing. Okay, um, is that maybe CrossF team may respond to these questions? Um, I would say this might be a question that Estelle might have more insight to because it's kind of tied to another question that Reese has written in the chat, which is also, is it the experience of organizations uh, that there's higher awareness of their organizations amongst librarians and support staff and less among researchers? And I would say that is the case for Crossref, um, mm -hmm. that we see that there's definitely a higher awareness of who Crossref is and what we do among sort of publishers and librarians and less so among researchers. Um, researchers know, they know what a DOI is, they see it on a paper, but they don't really know uh, that much more than that on, on average, I would say, and that's definitely a missing piece that we need to do some more work on and some more outreach to engage researchers. Um, so in terms of that, um, we haven't really seen much of researchers advocating for the use of PIDs where we haven't seen them supported, but that might be different for ORCID because they are sort of your primary audience, so I'll hand over to <laughs> Yeah, I just want yeah, thank you, Takeda, for and Vanessa. I just and thank you uh, for um, participants who asked this great question. I think from my past uh, experiences, I think now at least both in APAC or globally, I think researchers now they will register for OKID, no matter what for what reason. Some probably they are mandating <laughs> during the publishing workflow, but start recognize the value. I mean, researchers themselves. So I think the challenge to me is about, yeah, researchers have their ORCID ID is not that difficult, but yeah, how to demonstrate the value of that will require infrastructure. So you, you have the ID first, that's good, but that ID needs to be adopted in the infrastructure. So the vision and the, the goals we just discussed in our presentation can be achieved and can, you know, researchers can really recognize that's the value. And also um, speaking for ORCID, I think, um, Actually, our member organizations enable that to happen. So researchers have their ID first, but it's our member organization or organizations that will kind of build the environment so researchers can benefit from those, from those infrastructure. So I think for librarians or um, research administrators that actually works between researchers and their organizations, I think uh, they play a very critical role in how to catalyze adoptions. In, into their organization and also for researchers. 
Thank you. Okay. One of the other things, sorry, I, one of the other things is researchers, as researchers, we very rarely advocate for anything new, except obviously more money for us to do research. Um, that's what we're focused on. What researchers complain about is being asked to do things over and over again. Um, and so the power, particularly of open infrastructures, um, is that there's the possibility of only having to do it once. Um, and I remember when, when ORCID first started, and I was trying to explain to people why they should go and, and fill out their ORCID profile, um, I would say to them, this is the last profile you need to fill out. And then they, but they would say to me, but that's what I was told for the last five profile systems. Um, and, and those profile systems were built in different ways. In fact, the, the, the origin of ORCID is in the realization that a commercial system simply wasn't gonna work um, to deliver the kind of global reach that was needed to be useful. So, so I think that for me, that's, the, that's one of the things that for researchers is not just saying that in principle, they only need to do it once, but actually using the power of open infrastructures to draw that information, to correct it upstream, to correct it up where it should be corrected with Crossref and data sites for the publishers and then in ORCID for the, for the researcher themselves, and then using that information to actually reduce the burden of reporting is incredibly powerful when you get it right. Um, so researchers won't advocate for the use of PIDs, but they will definitely advocate for things that mean we don't have to fill things in over and over and over again. I've been asked for my publications list six times in the last nine months. Okay, thank you. So I now uh, give people a link to my to the PDF of my ORCID profile. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, okay, we are running out of time. So I uh, have a sweet question maybe. So uh, any, okay, um, any short answer for the rest of those three questions? Um, yeah. Yeah, I saw there's a question in the chat. It's about uh, Ali uh, Yusnawati, sorry if I pronounce incorrectly. Yeah, he's asking about uh, sharing successful stories that we use to, uh, that people can use to, for each of your organization. I, I would just want to highlight, I think the first step is always about starting conversations. So I've run actually multiple times that people or the community are interested in doing more with us, but they just don't ask. So I think I will probably highlight, yeah, the first is about just to ask, to keep conversation going, then you will know more and you can start. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, as a response, uh... Uh, yeah, I've got a response yes, to that please. one, maybe. Um, so some success stories. Um, so I think I mentioned in my talk that we've recently um, opened up membership to Crush to also fund us. So it's quite a new thing for us. So that sort of was in 2019. Um, and we've started to see that we've now got over, I think, um, 38,000 grants that have been registered in that period of time, which is quite a lot. And within the metadata, we can now see about 10% of all the registered grants that we have are now linked to other research outputs. So that is already starting to build those connections between the different um, pieces of the puzzle of the research, uh, the scholarly record. Um, so although that's quite new for us, that's that's still quite a milestone and it's something we're working on. So it's it's an example of a, um, a community need that we then sort of developed and fulfilled and now we're starting to see the use of it. So that's really good. Okay, thank you. So. Okay, uh, we apologize. So we cannot so respond to all questions. So uh, we have run out of time. So uh, okay, so last so item. So okay, okay last poll. <laughs> so uh, shall we please? Yes, let's uh, use the last minute for a uh, uh, for a last minute poll. Um, it's the same Minty page, and uh, we revisit the same question we have asked you before this round of presentations, how much you agree with the following statement. Mm -hmm. The benefit of using services based on open infrastructure is clear to me. The commitment required for adopting services based on an open infrastructure is clear to me. And I would prefer to adopt services that are built on open infrastructure than those that are not when they serve the same purpose. Uh, Charlie, please, could you yes. share your screen? 
Oh, sorry, I'm not hearing my screen. Oh. <laughs> uh, apologize. Yes. Wow, great. <laughs> yes, so having really positive answers. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, just a uh, one half an hour. <laughs> we get some uh, right. Um, so one last question. For you, Crossref data site and Orchid are infrastructure I can benefit from, services I can purchase, communities I can join, or project I can contribute to. Right. Okay, I think we uh, are at time is up for this webinar. Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, so that yeah, it's a great response. Uh, I'm I'm really thank you for like uh, speaker and also participant. So uh, it's a great time. So for us, because uh, yeah, it's a really so I'm I'm really so uh, 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 have have great time because uh, this is a so, uh, event in, in so APAC region. So uh, of course it's other uh, participants from uh, all over the world. But so yeah, because all all this. I, I'm happy to have this kind of so event so in in, in this time zone because uh, because uh, yeah so uh, yeah, now so a lot of people are already aware of uh, this issue in this thing so I hope I hope so we have so another chance uh, to have uh, this kind of so events again. Okay, thank you very much for joining this webinar. So uh, I hope so we will gather again so soon. Okay, that's the end of so webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a great day.